Okay. So I will do this. And here I am. Right? Ta-da! There I am. I've got Palm Springs on this. I like Palm Springs. I had somebody there. I actually knew John Lear. Oh, I used to chat with him on Facebook before I got my first time I got thrown off Facebook. Oh, your first time you got thrown off Facebook? Yeah, I, I, I got bounced out of there, I guess, a couple of times. But I used to be I used to be friendly with him on Facebook. And to be honest, I didn't really know exactly who he was at the time. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah, but he was um, a bit supportive of my information and me coming out is all I, you know, I could basically say about it. Well, I think that's very important. So, um, well, we've started. Um, I'm recording. So um, my background is I've been looking at the UFO thing and find out that they were making aliens and bases around here in England. Mm -hmm. So um, I sort of find out that it's a bit odd that they would make aliens in, in England, the British countryside west of London. So I thought that might involve some investigation. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I'm familiar with uh, Raytheon, mm -hmm. uh, and and what uh, aspect is Raytheon related? Is it, is it still Raytheon, or is it Kinetic these days? Kinetic. They changed. They changed their name, from my understanding, shortly after I gave my testimony, which I was very happy to have kicked them in the uh, the gonads so hard, so to say. But I believe they officially changed their name to RTX. Ah. Even though a lot of their buildings are still labeled as Raytheon, I imagine it's going to take them some time and money to switch everything up. Actually, they, um, we had a place, uh, we have a, a village here in Wiltshire called Wooten Bassett, and that mm -hmm. is where an awful lot of the British um, Army and stuff came back from Afghanistan. And then the mm -hmm. Ministry of Defense, that was RAF uh, Lynham, and then they mm -hmm. decided to change things around a little bit and call it um, uh, MOD Lynham, and the RAF went somewhere else. But in mm -hmm. passing, they decided to honor the town, honor the town by calling it Royal Wooden Bassett for its tremendous uh, contribution to, um, well, to the war effort. And, you know, it, it, it was a big honor. But unfortunately, the local mm -hmm. town council had to bear the cost of changing all the road signs. Oh, that was nice of them. So anyway, we don't need to talk about road signs. Uh, a long time ago, a friend of mine, when I was at school, um, we got a lecture from a member of the British Antarctic Survey. Mm -hmm. We're talking a long time ago, uh, because I've obviously been, not, it's not at school, but the point is, he had filmed a black ray uh, from the sky causing a disturbance in the ice. Mm -hmm. And uh, he got color film of that, and he gave us some color um, slides of that. We're talking early 70s. So somebody mm -hmm. was operating some kind of advanced technology way back then mm -hmm. uh, and uh, British the, the University, Queen's University of Belfast was was committed to the British Antarctic team all those years ago so mm -hmm. a long time ago uh, in the geography lesson I found out there was something odd and rather different going on in Antarctica other than the Scott expedition and Queen mm -hmm. Maud Land being taken over by a bunch of people south of Norway Europe called the Nazis. Mm -hmm. obviously moved on since then so what brought what's your background and, and um, actually I, actually just before i let you talk uh, dr stephen Gray is here in the uk so oh he, excellent he, yeah i thought i saw something about that yeah so he he's 
causing trouble. Mm. Always good to cause trouble. So Absolutely. what's your background and what brought you to Antarctica and um, and obviously other places? Um, what, what brought me to Antarctica was the Obama administration tanking the economy in the United States. And I just started looking for alternative employment. And at the time, in uh, November of 2010, Raytheon Polar Services was the only company on the face of the earth that was willing to cut me a check. So I accepted their offer to go to the South Pole Station. And I stayed there for 366 days straight. And I did not leave until November of 2011. Well, that was a good introduction to your first shift. Yeah. Um, so Raytheon, for those who don't know what we're talking about, what is Raytheon and what was your what was your service there? Raytheon is a, is one of the United States um, biggest military industrial contractors and they had the um, I guess you would say the the contract from the National Science Foundation to provide the logistical support uh, for the United States Antarctic program at that time period. Currently, uh, they no longer hold the contract, and now it has um, been distributed to Lockheed Martin, which is, again, a military industrial contractor. And I think people should pay close attention to the fact that these contracts keep being uh, bid on and, and garnered by military industrial contractors who make weapons when there are plenty of other contractors out there that could provide logistical support uh, that aren't in the weapons making industry so i mean obviously there's a lot of ice in antarctica and penguins so mm -hmm. what what would uh, military industrial complex companies have an interest in antarctica I, I mean i gather the vatican has a telescope down there or something but there's a little bit more going on I don't know. I've never heard anything about the Vatican having a telescope. Well, they probably down there. Least, it does, they probably doesn't mean, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't mean it's not going on, but um, I just haven't heard of that, so I can't attest to it. Uh, but my my experience and what it sounds like from your uh, the member of the British Antarctic Survey that you mentioned is it appears that they have what are commonly referred to as directed energy weapons systems down in Antarctica and specific to my experience at the South Pole Station. I, I located and shared the information publicly first and then I went to Washington DC last June in 2023 and I testified before both the Senate Intelligence Committee and that new faction known as Arrow. I gave them my testimony, I gave them my documentation. Um, they thanked me for sharing the information with them I was told that they would be expediting my information to Congress for its consideration and that the uh, information I shared, or I should say the communications that we had, uh, were going to go into the National Archives. Most importantly from those conversations was how we wrapped up with a conversation regarding what do we do with the rogue factions that seem to exist that are operating outside the oversight of the U.S. Congress and therefore the American people is basically where we left it, but without having the answers. It just seems that we are now cognizant of the fact that these technologies, as you stated earlier, um, have been around for a while. And who's using them and for what? Well, it seems that there's a little bit of a hissy fit in a tantrum when some guy called Admiral Byrd led a small expedition to Antarctica. Would that mm -hmm. involve those rogue factions? Uh, I don't know that it was necessarily rogue then. Well, um, I'm using I'm using I'm using polite terminology to, or do you, if you want to use any other terminology. Oh no, worries. I, 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 but but even taking that into consideration, I I don't believe those operations were rogue at the time. I believe they were still operating. Um, with appropriate oversight, and it has since then deviated. It's what he met down there, and he didn't seem to have a gr great reception. Um, yeah, some, something seems to have gone awry down there, but I think a lot of people have taken um, great liberties to take a lot of his information and run with it um, outside of the context it was presented in. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously not a lot of people have been down to Antarctica, um, one of the big um, problems when discussing um, Bird's information 
is most people have no idea how interchangeable the term Antarctica and South Pole was back then. Now, what's the they difference? You know, so the difference is the South Pole is the South Pole at, at 90 degrees south. It's a very specific point in Antarctica. And Antarctica so is not exactly a very small place. It's the fifth largest continent. It's massive. So, you know, a lot of people like to um, run with this concept of that Admiral Byrd stated that he found a hole in the ice at the South Pole as if he meant specifically 90 degrees south, when in reality he was just referring to the continent of Antarctica. Okay, this Byrd is very important. Very, it's, it is very important. Um my understanding is that when Byrd made the uh, notes in his journal about seeing a hole in the ice, that he also stated that he was at 1,900 feet of elevation. Well, the ice plateaus, uh, about 9,300 feet of elevation. So for the elevation that he was reporting that he was at, he had to be on the coast, of which there would be tons of holes in the ice yeah. in that continent. So people are just taking great liberties, and it's my belief that there is a lot of disinformationists in the disclosure community that are trying to uh, control the narrative and focus the people's attention on a lot of speculative BS. When there's actionable intelligence from folks like myself that are trying to get it out to the people, but we have all these disinformationists muddying the waters and causing um, confusion. Well, the 100% object that I want to do is clear that confusion and get the exact data. Uh, Same here. I mean, I have a, a, Fr a French colleague and uh, they had a base down there called Concordia. It had some problems and I think they had to wait for the Russians to get to them to help them. They had all their kit taken out by some kind of directed energy weapon of some kind and they ha had to sit there in the ice for six months before they were picked up. That was a French-Italian base. And I'm sure these bases are very far apart. Uh, Absolutely. I mean, what what's it sort of like from an overview point of view uh, about who's there and who sort of owns what? You've got the British sector or whatever and America and Australia. So where yeah, about I mean, were there's, you, there's, whereabouts were you operating and how cooperative are things there? I mean, we're all, they're all, you know, how, how does Paint a picture of that just from a wider perspective. I was, I was literally at the South Pole Station. I was at 90 degrees south, the bottom of the planet, um, in the middle of Antarctica for all practical purposes. I was not on the coast. Um, I believe uh, as a bird flies, it's 950 miles from McMurdo Station on the coast inland to get to the South Pole Station. And it's at 9,300 feet of elevation. There's not a mountain peak to see. There's nothing. It is just a, well, I guess what you would call an ice field. So, okay, you've got an ice field, and that means it's got certain functions. So the nearest, the nearest other base would be, uh, I mean, uh, there was a BBC TV program made with one of the Monty Python uh, participants, and he did a, a, a show about going from north to south pole and it was very clear even with diplomatic that he wasn't entirely welcome at the south pole as a civilian why mm -hmm. is it so secure what's the big deal there uh, it's it's not secure there's nothing secure about antarctica um i've never heard of anybody actually being unwelcomed um i was present when there was tons of tourists that arrived and the only restriction to access to anything in Antarctica, uh, much like anywhere else in the world, seems to be how fat your wallet is. Oh, well, okay. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's no military presence defending access to Antarctica. That's, it's all disinformation. Well, this is what I want to clear up. So, I mean, there's no secret bases with, with people with whatever, whatever. But I mean, every, every I mean, base, you're in the middle of nowhere. Has its secrets. Yeah, you're in the middle of nowhere. So there's, you know, logistically, it's almost impossible for someone to attack. And I, I, I want to make sure that we're careful with words here because I would say there was 
a lot of secrets at the South Pole Station. Um, but like many other facilities that I have worked at, um, the most secret facilities don't have a sign that says top secret. They don't have barbed wire fences. They don't have 24-hour armed guards. They have what's called compartmentalization and yes. a need-to-know basis. Yeah. And the average citizen can actually walk into some of the most secret facilities out there, and they would never even know it. Um, as a perfect example, when I went to Washington, D.C. to testify in front of the, the Arrow group, now, the only thing I'm not allowed to discuss from that contact and communication was, A, the address of the facility, and B, the names of the two people um, that I testified in front of. But with that being said, the building is a very benign building. It's in an industrial park. It has many other offices in it, and anybody in the world can walk off of the street into that building. And they would not know that they are in the presence of one of the most top secret information sharing buildings in the world. I suppose if you wanted to keep something secret, you just keep the, don't put a little sign up saying security or something. Precisely. You just don't. Precisely. You're you're putting a, you're putting a target and 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 what's, educating people. What's going on, on what in you're there? Hiding. In the Arrow Building. Yeah. So. so what? Commun communications yeah. of top secret information in a secure environment. Now, because of the place you're in, location, what are communications mm -hmm. like from a strategic uh, atmospheric transmission point of view? Can you get signals in and out further than you would otherwise get, depending on the way that the atmosphere works? From the South Pole? Yeah. I'm, refer um, I'm referring we, to... We, I'm, de I'm referring to... Uh, high altitude uh, electrical aspects of transmission, certain signals well, that's, go that's further. That's precisely that's what the um, the ice cube neutrino detector, when um, when in its transmit mode, um, because of the type of system that it is, um, it can pretty much um, transmit to anywhere on the planet and most likely off. This is the level of technology that we're at now is it's way beyond the, the conventional understanding of um, communications or transmissions. We're, we're way beyond that. This gets into um, the conversation of faster-than-light communications, which would be off-world. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you've heard of Gary McKinnon and yes, that he disclosed yes. to the world that you know, there's, there's a, on a, a, a on list a dial, of On a dial-up modem. Yeah. Right. So... He, he showed the world that there's an off-world fleet and the respective names of the captains. Well, obviously, if we have a fleet out in the cosmos, we, we need a means to communicate with them. I am just basically pointing um, to one of those facilities that I found. So explain all so that. I, and, I mean, I, I'm an engineer. I know about transmission. I built a few stations. Oh, you got it. So, okay. yeah, yeah. The, ice, the ice cube neutrino detector has um, buried in the ice 5,160 um, what they refer to as DOMS, digital optical modules. The presentation on the science end of it is that these DOMS uh, register the flash of blue light that is created when a neutrino impacts the nucleus of one of the water molecules, which is ice down there. Uh, the nucleus is destroyed, the neutrino is destroyed, and a muon is ejected along with the blue flash of Sharonkov radiation. So that blue flash is detected by the DOMS, and that's what we're presented as the primary science of the facility. But what I presented publicly and to the Senate Intelligence Committee in Arrow was the documented proof that each of the DOMs actually has the capacity to transmit at up to 2,047 volts each, making it the world's largest phased array transmitter, which we can simply think of a, 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 a harp array on steroids because the distinct difference, I'm sure you can appreciate as an engineer, yeah. that a harp system typically, like in Gakona, Alaska, it's on the surface of the earth, it has the dimensions of length and width. It's a plane. But at the South Pole, you have length, width, and depth because that it goes down is, into the ice. And that would mean that you could steer that signal. I mean, for instance, uh, I, 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 I have a nickname called Megawatts, 
We, we mm. ran a five kilowatt transmitter into an antenna array and using the strategically a measured distance between each of the antennas that gave us mm -hmm. antenna gain without right. having to have to pay the electric bill. So we got right. one megawatt of gain uh, mm -hmm. to give us a million watts to transmit uh, a, a distance on FM, which normally you wouldn't bother doing. Uh, so mm -hmm. uh, the, the point is from the strategic point of view of phased arrays, you've mm -hmm. got a steerable, depending on how you alter the phase of the yes. signal electrically between those, but you've got the 3D thing. You can put a, a beam or a narrow beam or whatever. That's an extremely flexible antenna array. So what, Correct. So what, and, okay, and explain for clarification, um, everybody should realize too that they're, they're currently moving forwards to make the ice cube array 10 times bigger than what it is. Well, that's a, that's a lot. Now, is that yeah, physically going to expand it? Or just the individual yes, power of each one of the the, the devices. No, they're they're by by size. So um, just times it times it by ten. Imagine if you have you know the one system there right now. Just imagine you took ten more identical ones and surrounded the original. It's a bit like using all those dishes across the world to to pick up something from a from a far distant galaxy on a reception mm -hmm. point of view. You can get all those mm -hmm. dishes to work together, and that gives you more signal reception. And, and yes. also yes. your signal to noise Each, ratio. Yeah, in my in my brain, I think of it almost like a firing sequence. You know, if you're going to put two thousand volts out of one, these items, the DOMs are about the size of a basketball. So in my brain, I picture you know if they fire one here and they fire one there, and you know like Ghostbusters if they're crossing the streams, so to say. And it's just a matter of how they want to um, light this thing up on the transmit side that there has to be some sort of value to the, the shape of which this three-dimensional array um, transmits. That the, and I believe that you know my meager understanding of um, electrical engineering, um, it's easy to comprehend to me that this is a very powerful system when it comes to targeted transmission. And also because of the ice, it, it operates with a lot more um, efficiency in terms of noise. I would imagine so, that yes, because of the um, lack of all other RF frequencies in the area, that there would be something to be said for a cleaner operation without interference. So what sort of signals? Um, okay, who's transmitting and who's receiving? That seems to be the big question. So after I communicated um, at both of these skip facilities, um, like I mentioned earlier, the conversation went to um, who's running these things. And it appears that there are rogue factions operating without the oversight of the U.S. Congress and therefore the American public. And the, the question remains on the table. Who's who's the rogue agencies and what are they up to? And the, the current answer, unfortunately, is we don't know who and they can be doing whatever they want until we stop them. Well, you mentioned Gary McKinnon. So that mm -hmm. brings in the secret space program, all mm -hmm. those officers. So um, how much do you know or f about that with regard to this transmission and reception system? It has something to do with it for sure. I was um, contacted by John Warner the Fourth, son of John Warner the yep, Third. Excellent guy. Um, yeah, I, I've seen. Guy, I've guy. seen that he's done some excellent interviews with dark journalist D D Daniel List. Yes, absolutely. Yes, I, I dark, people I, need to pay attention to dark journalists. He's he's on it. Um, I do not support anybody in the disclosure community when it comes to their Antarctica research, except dark journalist which drives me nuts because he ignores me i've tried to reach out and give him support um but he's yet to contact me back i would love to talk to him um but he's on it um, i think back to john it's, warner it's, uh this is this is my personal analysis of that i think he's had a little knock on the door uh, yeah we all do yeah okay yeah i get knocks on the door regularly and i tell him the fuck off oh that, that's that's rude positively rude but, but, but maybe maybe that's the only language they understand 
So we're dealing. They seem to understand it very clearly. Yeah, but that, back to John Warner. Back to John Warner and the topic about the secret space program. Now, for and those technology. for those who don't know who John Warner is and the kind of things he says, could you sort of round that up in a couple of minutes? Yes, absolutely. Yes, his his father was formerly the Secretary of the Navy as well as the Republican Senator of Virginia. But as his role in Senator of the Navy, that put him in charge of Operation Deep Freeze down in Antarctica, and he has visited the continent a couple of times. Before he passed away, uh, John the son asked John the father, you know, um, I hear there's a lot of uh, submarine activity in Antarctica. His father expressed that the submarines were actually using um, steam equipment to drill under the ice and work under the ice in Antarctica. He asked his father why. His father's response was space operations. So uh, also I'm told due to a guy called Tomlinson that maybe they use submarine hulls in space as an efficient space transportation system. I believe so. When I was in the United States Submarine Service, it was beat into our heads that we were the research and development department for NASA. And if it works on a submarine, it will work in space. And so uh, one has to sort of ponder the question, how do you get a friggin' heavy steel submarine up into space? Why does that Easy. work? You watch the movie The Hunt for Red October, which is a true story. It's a great film. Tom Clancy's not an author. He's a disseminator of information for a faction. And in that movie, they discuss the propulsion system, the Caterpillar drive of yeah. the Red October which is the propulsion system of the Seawolf class submarine and more than likely uh, the ships that came, the boats that came afterwards. The magnetohydrodynamic drive uses, uh, I guess you would say, electromagnetic frequency to move water through the hull to propel the submarine when it's in the medium of water. Well, the atmosphere is just a less dense version of the water. So you just need to increase the power and submarines fly. Ta-da! And the other thing is that we don't have an empty space. We have plasma in space. So therefore, if you're traveling at a high speed, you may be behaving like a submarine in a plasma sea. No, I'll have to take your word for it on that one. I never really considered that the vastness of space was actually filled with plasma. Intelligent plasma. There's some research on that, and therefore... Mm -hmm. You've got maybe other things going on there. So if you're traveling fast enough, you're, it's maybe going to be behaving like a fluid substance. Therefore, a submarine... Well, again, even back again, just pondering the function of, an, uh, of the magnetohydrodynamic drive, it would almost stand to reason that if you're um, working in those frequencies that you could then somehow um, harness some sort of engagement of flow through that medium because one thing people don't understand is one reason uh, it uh, as much as you push the water or the fluid out of the way at the front it sucks backwards at the back so that's why you need to yeah. make the skin effect of of that mm -hmm. and i think yes, i think i mean i think john Warner, aerodynamics and hydrodynamics are very similar when you're talking about moving about the hull of a vessel so anything you can get rid of the, f the stiction effect makes it more effective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what are they? I think they call that hy hygrophobic, when you can um, make the water pass over the surface uh, with greater ease, which is also what they're doing with the with a lot of the airplanes. That's some of the top secret technology. Is you know when they when they electrify the front yeah, end like of the, the, the wing, the, the, the B two bomber, a, or is it the B one? Yeah, they, they, they cause a, an exchange with electricity at the front end of the wing. So there's a plasma effect, which effectively causes a vacuum to be produced in the front of the plane. So it's not really that you're thrusting the plane forwards. You're creating a vacuum for which the plane then just gets pulled into. So it's a it – and I'm sure if we're discussing that kind of technology, they've probably mastered it rather well maybe 50 years ago. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, this, this, the, that's the, one of the things that the community at large is having trouble with is they're not realizing that this technology has been around for uh, quite a few decades and these rogue factions are doing due diligence to present the technology to the world as if it's all unknown flying objects, UFOs, and that it's little green aliens when in fact it's just these rogue agencies 
that are, you know, monopolizing the technology, profiteering, fighting with each other, and just doing whatever they can to keep us out of the loop. Well, uh, I think the other thing that people should understand is that Isaac Newton did not discover gravity. He discovered that the electric field force is the dominant force. Therefore, if you have an electric field mm -hmm. uh, type of control, you're flying, literally. Yeah, absolutely. There's, there's a lot of other ways. There are smarter people now discussing this concept of gravity, electricity, the relationships between them. You know, what did Nikola Tesla ap ap actually observe and take advantage of? And it seems like his alternating current, as he put to the world, um, really is uh, copying a, um, a process of nature in regards to gravity and almost like a like a pulsation of um, different forces of gravity. I think there's other people suggesting that how do bumblebees fly and how do right. scarab beetles fly is some mm -hmm. kind of electrical other thing. Mm -hmm. So we've 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 talked about um, John Warner and his father. I think he did a, he did a few other little things. Do you want to go into that? Uh, which Warner are you referencing? Uh, well, the son learning off daddy. Mm -hmm. Oh. Um, In terms of aircraft carriers and things, be able to move, maneuver rather more quickly. Oh, yes. Uh, John John Jr. had uh, mentioned, I think it was the movie The Final Countdown in the 1980s, which was about, it was a, it was a movie that was, I mean, pretty much produced by the United States Navy. Um, all access to every, you know, ship and plane that they possessed. And then um, John said that he attended the premiere of that movie. And I forget which top brass guy he stated turned around at the end of the movie. But effectively, it was a movie about, you know, the Navy having time control. And at the end of the movie, somebody turned around and, you know, shook their hands and said, yep, we have our new recruiting movie now. Well, that's what you've got. But this is the, one of the things about the secret space program. You've got to get your cooks and uh, lug nut uh, maintenance teams on that and it seems yep. uh, I mean how, how so do you think that was how you were brought in in terms of what you were doing there I do I do think that that is somehow um, how my career path went um, both through the submarine service through the uh, military industrial contractor corporation facilities that I worked at on Long Island I also worked at the homes of the owners of these corporations Obviously, I was down at South Pole Station, but yes, you're right. These facilities, you know, if, if we had a base on the moon, um, there's going to be plumbers, electricians, carpenters. There's going to be all the standard support staff, and these folks have to be very good at what they do. And I think that in that capacity, I found myself at the South Pole Station. So for John Warner teases me. John Warner teases me on this one all the time. He goes, "You really think you're at the South Pole of our planet?" Oh, he teases me like they sent me somewhere else, and how? And he's right. How would I know? I mean, if they lied to me and just you know stuck me in a plane, knocked me out, and dropped me off somewhere else, and said, "Now you're at the South Pole of Earth," I mean, uh, or maybe some place where the sky is blue, which they tell us it's red. Mm -hmm. That was one of the things with the Viking lander. Would you know? Oh. I mean. I mean, okay, you're talking extraterrestrial. You're talking potential alien races. What are we up mm -hmm. there doing? What, what's happening there? Uh, at the South Pole? Well, at the South Pole or maybe where you were in Mars or some other location. Well, where, wherever I was, um, I didn't see any aliens. But were there... I did see, I did see, a, I did see a UFO of sorts. Um, at whatever location I was at, it was a, a massive, giant, um, round fireball that went from horizon to horizon at an absurd rate of speed. It never went up. It never went down. It, it flew straight as an arrow. And to me, that was indicative of a very controlled flight path. Okay, well, let's get down to exactly what you said in your disclosure to those important gentlemen. Basically, I expressed to them and, and gave them the information, uh, both through testimony and documentation, that there are at least three directed energy weapon systems at the South Pole Station. 
that the ice cube neutrino detector is one when it's in its transmit mode. It has the ability to generate earthquakes, which we caused two of them in February of 2011 in Christchurch, New Zealand. It has the capacity to function as an air traffic control tower for the um, the UFOs, um, whether they are off-world, in-world, or man-made. They appear to um, expel neutrinos from their exotic propulsion systems. So it seems that they're observing the activity of the flight patterns of everything moving around, both on and off of our planet. I discovered that there was an ELF system at the South Pole Station that I was told was off, but I discovered that it was on. And then at another building called ARO, ARO, the Atmospheric Research Observatory, I observed uh, a very powerful green laser shooting out into the cosmos. Uh, of the three, that's the one that I'm still researching and know the least about, but the concept, or I should say the term of chemical lasers and superfluids seems to be involved with this system because there is a massive amount of helium at the South Pole Station, or at least when I was there, and it was chilled down to four degrees Kelvin, which puts us in this uh, less discussed term of superfluids and chemical lasers. Um, well, so there's a lot of, of shenanigans. Yeah, I mean, are we talk there's uh, helium three or something on the moon. Other people, and I just actually, I I just recently found out there was helium three at the South Pole. I ran into someone um, from the program, and he communicated to me that the helium source that I was referencing um, was actually a substantial amount of helium three, for which um, he conveyed to me that as a scientist there utilizing the H three that they used so little of it that he too also did not understand why there was so much helium three there. But that goes to my hypothesis that there is um, a different power supply there that is not the standard cat uh, generators because they do not seem to be powerful enough to support the systems as presented. So I do believe there's some sort of um, other power source. And I was very surprised, pleasantly surprised to hear somebody admit that there was H3 there in great volume because to me that um, is a fuel supply that could be utilized to support my conjecture that there's an alternative power supply. Would that be cold fusion? Uh, I guess technically it could be. Uh, I'm still investigating to what that other power supply is. My initial speculation, as testified before both of those committees, was that at the very least, I believe that the, the old pole, which was constructed in 1957 and seemingly blown up in uh, the summer season of 2010 when I was present, um, which I still question if they actually did it or if they just put on a show. But I believe the original old pole probably had a, a, a PM8 nuclear power facility connected to it because it would have been there prior to the signing of the Antarctic Treaty. So it kind of would have got grandfathered in. 